Of course, one thing you want to consider also is that many times the conformation of molecules can differ. So a molecule that has an inversion center in one conformation may not have an inversion center in another, but it may have some other symmetry operation in another. So, for instance, if we took this molecule with the inversion center and rotated about the single bond, there's definitely free rotation about that single bond, we would arrive at a conformation that looked like this. Swinging this fluorine up would push the bromine to the back and the chlorine to the front, and the other fluorine remained unchanged. And hopefully looking at this, you're able to see that there is a plane of symmetry in this molecule right down the middle like that. And so here we see that the molecule is still achiral. And in, indeed, we would call this compound achiral overall because it possesses a conformation which is achiral, which we determine from the inversion center and the plane of symmetry. If a molecule possesses an accessible conformation that's achiral, we generally call it achiral overall, or usually just call it achiral. So that's sort of a crash course on how to decide what molecules are chiral. Look for a plane of symmetry or an inversion center. If you find one, you know that the molecule is achiral. If you don't find one, then that means that the molecule must be chiral assuming you didn't just miss the plane of symmetry or inversion center of the molecule. All right, so now let's move on to the physical consequences of chirality. And really, you can think about this in terms of why is chirality important? Why is the spatial component of molecules important, particularly in the context of enantiomers, which are... Um, mirror images that are non-superimposable, just to remind you, enantiomers have the exact same energy. And we'll talk about why in more detail next time. But if you think about that, really all of the internal distances in both this molecule and its enantiomer are the same. The bromine is the same distance from the fluorine, chlorine, carbon, and hydrogen atoms in either of these molecules. So all of the atoms are going to react the exact same way, you would think. But there are some subtle differences between enantiomers that allow us to detect them, separate them, and really use their differences to an advantage in organic chemistry. So we're going to talk about sort of the earliest discovery of the physical difference between enantiomers, and that has to do with optical activity. So an interesting observation that was made more so by physicists than chemists in the early days is that light is chiral. So typically we think of light, right, as a wave of oscillating electromagnetic energy going up and down and up and down. And for a light wave propagating in this direction, we would have, uh, we would expect light to be propagating, for a, for a waveform that looks like this, excuse me, we would expect the light to be propagating in that direction. Now let's rotate this picture 90 degrees and look at it just straight on. If we looked at it just straight on, we would see the light going up and down and up and down and up and down as it forged ahead, right? So in this case, the direction of propagation is into the plane of the screen. There's such a thing as chiral light. So imagine taking this and sort of dividing it up into two components, a circular component that rotated this way. So we're still looking at the direction of light going into the plane of the screen. But imagine, instead of going simply up and down and up and down, the light is going around like this in sort of a helix. So as we watch the light propagate, we'll see it go in a circle as it travels. If we take, and so what that would look like in terms of this direction, is that would look like the light kind of coming in, maybe helixing around like so. Imagine we took that and we combined it with another circularly polarized, as it's called, uh, ray of light traveling in the plane of the screen still, except going in the opposite direction. So rotating to the left instead of to the right. And that would look quite similar, 
except it would be different, it would be rotating in a different direction as it propagated. If we combine these two, we would get the plane polarized light we're used to seeing, but each of these helices is chiral. Right? There's no plane of symmetry or inversion center in either of those helices. So the interesting thing we observe is that chiral molecules, uh, chiral molecules that are present in pure form, so present as only a single enantiomer, have the ability to rotate plane polarized light. So what they do is they essentially will slow down the rotation of one of these helices more than the other, and that tilts the plane of the light after it passes through the molecule. So just to give you an idea of what polarization looks like in terms of an instrument, so typically what an instrument like that will look like is plane polarized light will enter the sample chamber and here's the sample chamber of your chiral compound and when the light comes out, it will be the plane of the light will be rotated. So this is a bit difficult for me to draw, but basically I can draw the directions slightly differently down below. So looking again, going into the plane of the screen, we would see this sort of tilted plane for the light, whereas the input light is just straight up and down. And so the difference between those two or the angle between them, I should say, is what's referred to as the specific rotation or optical activity of that chiral compound. And every uh, chiral compound has a unique specific rotation, so we can characterize chiral compounds this way. We can see whether we have a pure enantiomer of a species or not, one more interesting thing I'll say about this is that two enantiomers in a pair rotate light in opposite directions. So we represent enantiomers by the designations S and R. So if the S enantiomer rotated light, say, this way, say it did it by roughly 60 degrees, then the R enantiomer would rotate that light exactly the opposite direction at about negative 60 degrees. And so a pure mixture of enantiomers will appear to be a chiral, at least by optical rotation, and will rotate light zero degrees. So we can gauge, if we know the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer, we can gauge the purity of our own sample by looking at how much it rotates the light. If it rotates at zero, we know we have a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers. If it's non-zero, we know we have slightly more than more of one enantiomer than the other. So that's, this is the primary, really, physical consequence of chirality, that because light can be chiral, it can take on this helical form, chiral molecules can rotate the plane of polarized light, and we can actually observe that by using a polarizer. So the way the angle is actually measured is that when the light comes out, there is a disk here that's called a polarizer with, with vertical lines on it, essentially, and that disk is rotated around until the polarized light actually makes it through. So when the light makes it through, we know that we're at the proper angle. So we can compare that to the sort of zero degree standard that we sent in and see how much the compound rotated the light.